I hope you can see on my screen, everyone. Yes. Thank you very much for, yeah, I would, I would love to actually to start by thanking everyone, uh, the organizing committee, everyone, the participants in this uh, forum. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, guys, and thank you very much for the, invite, the invite to speak here. Um, I just wanted to get a brief about what we are talking about, although it's a zero hunger, which is the SDG. Um, as someone who comes from a water background, I did my PhD in water engineering at Cambridge University in the UK in 2015, under the supervision of Dr. Professor Abira Tapa. And then I started as a postdoc there, and then before I started to go for academia in different locations until I landed in Australia two years ago as a senior lecturer in the School of Engineering and Technology at Central Queensland University, and I'm based in Melbourne campus. It's almost like 9.30 here in Melbourne, so good evening for everyone or afternoon. And in today's way, in today's talk, I'm going to, um, as someone who comes with a background from the water engineering, I'm going to try to see, uh, to put my like input here, although I'm not like a food guy, but I think there is much to do about the water and food. And that's why my topic was a food nexus and the pathway, how we can ensure the sustainable development by integrating the food, energy and water as an, a step or as an approach in order just to go for the zero hunger uh, second objective. Um, so I, I believe most of you are aware of this uh, very uh, familiar statement, which was sometimes ago, I think even before I was born, that there was a say by some a great man that in 10 years time, no child will go to the bed hungry. And this was actually in 1974 a few years before I was born. And I think uh, what we witnessed right now is something completely different because we ended up today as uh, recent statistics talking about about 800, uh, 800 million uh, people are going to the bed every day uh, while they are still hungry. So what happened between 1974 and today, there was some up and down, up and down and I think we did see, uh, we, did, we did witness, or we did uh, heard about the green revolution, which was intended to boost the food security, which actually can give us a good indication about that the problem of providing food or to the, the, the work or the collective work towards the zero hunger is not a very new or a recent work or a recent initiative. But this statement shows that there was some concern about this even 40 plus years ago. And uh, as I said in the beginning, um, the SDG, uh, which is something I strongly believe in, cannot be achieved if we are looking at each individual goal separately, or even if we are looking at each single individual area and working in a single area without a collective approach. So the WEF has been among the first organizations who, can, who did actually identify the relationship and interconnectivity between the different sectors. And what, when we are progressing in this presentation, we will try actually to highlight why we are talking about water food nexus or a collective approach, not only by tackling the problem of the zero hunger from a po from food perspective, but we need to look at the holistic approach, holistic connectivity between the food, the energy, and the water. And to myself, actually, I think we can add one more area in order to make it really a holistic approach uh, without any disturbance to any decision-making process that we are taking, whether it is like individually or collectively. So the, the, the reason why I'm talking about water actually because the IWMI says that as much as half of the water that we are using for food actually it's getting by, it's getting to be lost. And this means that when we talk about food, we are all the time talking about the, wood, the water and how we can grow more food. Although the definition of the problem of like of the like starvation or of lack of food around the world, it doesn't actually address 
or doesn't even say that we have a shortage in food, but it rather says that we have enough and rich resources or rich, rich uh, food. But the main problem that we are facing right now, it could be actually some of the supply chain system that we are working on. We've got some gaps or some breaks, some cuts along the supply chain system itself, or it might be some other uh, factors which interfere the activities that will belonging to the to the food, including the climate change and the population. And I wanted to say something here, guys, that as an environment, uh, environmental scientist or environmental engineer, to be honest, we are always trying to take the the side who are always talking about how to advise people to um, protect the environment. And we can, we can exactly be vigilant about any negative impact or negative action is happening around the world. Until I recently went to a talk before the COVID, um, which was um, run by the, uh, one of the organization, Australian organization here in Queensland, which was talking actually about shifting the uh, attitude about the environmental engineering, how we look at things in a, in a positive way. So we need to look at every single thing, including the population increase, including the climate change complexity, and including about the food and the water demand or the water scarcity in a positive way. And why we have to look at this, there are so many reasons which we will come across in, during the presentation. So the need to promote the, the WEF water, energy, and food mixers like, is already there. So there is no need to justify why we are talking, why we are taking this approach in addressing the zero hunger objective. Uh, there are so many work in every single sector to like to guarantee the food security without even looking at the different aspects in terms of how we will ensure this uh, away from other sectors, including water and uh, energy. So. As you can listen to my words here, the most frequent word I'm using here in terms of an, an exhaust is the water. And that's why when we started in 2014 by Hamdi, this is a, some, a resource where I got this figure from, you can look at the water, availability of the water, or the water security was in the core of the tot of the whole exhaust that we are talking about. And I think this uh, might upset some people who are working in the food industry or who are working in the energy industry because they think that water engineers, and I can always like um, notice this uh, kind of um, language among the other sectors that water, they think themselves are the central of the whole mixus. And I would agree and disagree at the same time about this because I believe that from water perspective, as a water engineer, I would say yes, water is like a, like it it cannot be like a, a tr treated as a good. But at the same time, I totally understand where this upsetting view is coming from when we talk about the food security and energy security. Because at the end of the day, we if even if we have enough water in the land, this water has to go for different purposes, and I can't see any other main objective to put the water, to invest the water, if you have it, in promoting the zero hunger objective. So what we are talking about, the water, energy, and food mix us here, is that we can see that there are some increasing demand with occasional poor access to one or more area. And this is exactly applicable to the food uh, problem. We, as, as all the researchers, and all the statistics says that we have enough food, which can be actually enough for the whole globe. The main problem is that we've got like really a problem in the attitude about farming and about landing. We've got like many cuts within the supply chain. How we get the food from the farming areas into the stores and then to the households. And this is like a kind of a complex circle, complex system depends on, but it's significantly varying from one, one area to another. If we look at the development, even this actually was addressed by different uh, researchers about the attitude of the farmers. Farmers themselves in a developing country, they behave differently from farmers in well-developed countries. While the, the farmers in developing countries or in poor countries are driven by making money out of their products, 
I think the other farmers might, might be like having different uh, initiative or different intensive why, we are, why they are doing this. So at the end of the day, we, we, we don't have any issues with the resource itself or with the quantity itself, but it's more likely with the supply chain, with the system, with how we manage it and how we are looking at these things as a global issue rather than a single thing. The other thing which could be a very a threat, a big threat to the water energy in Exos is the political uh, conflict. And I put here some of the uh, examples at the end of, this, of the slide between what we, we're looking at what's happening right now between different countries, including China, Australia, China, US, and even the Gulf tension. I can't see anything coming out from these all conflicts other than very negative impact to the agricultural sectors. In Australia, maybe you are aware about the increasing tariff of all the products that have been exported from Australia to China because of some political background. The same thing was happening between US and China. And then the tension, there is a tension in the Arabic area, which was leading that there are so many strict measures and like even changing the rules of exporting and importing the trading agreements between Qatar and different areas. And the reason I'm talking about this because I wanted to show that it's not a location specific, it could happen at any point of view. So what we can get out of this, rather than focusing on the water as the core of the whole nexus, we have to go for a problem shift. We don't, like we, we keep talking about shortages in oil, but like we started in the 80s talking about like forestation. And then we later on one decade ago, one decade after that, we started to talk about oil crisis. And then we found that we've got like renewable energy. So oil crisis is, is not a crisis. And then we started to talk about water in some recent years until today. And I think now we are talking about soil stability and I'm not very sure what will be the next problem that we are talking about. So we, as I said in the beginning, as environmental engineers, or, and I, I hope that this is a shared view with other uh, scientists from different disciplines that we need to start to think about things differently rather than looking at things and. And we've got like a solid history advising us that what we are doing right now could be relevant. And this is exactly what we are think what we should have uh, to change, what we should have to do in order to change our view towards the food itself. Um, I think rather than putting the water in the core area of the Nexus, I believe now we've started to talk about population, people themselves, the ecosystem and the climate change and different other parameters that we can find a unite background or solid actual intersection across the different disciplines to, to promote this area. I think when we talk about water scarcity or food scarcity or food shortage or even about energy, the main concern which we are all agree on is the population. We need to, human, we need to protect the humans we need to make sure that we are providing them a decent life or at least a minimum requirements of a decent life in order to grow them. And I think if we put this in our four area, every aspect, how we can correlate one area to another is going to be an easy task. But we need to agree while we are looking at the col collective approach, not about ourselves, our departmental interest. And I wanted to raise an example here, guys. Um, in one of the countries, which was recently, five years ago, I, the reason why we are talking about Nexus as a comprehensive approach, there was, in one country, there were more than one department or ministry. I remember that the strategic uh, plan for the water department was, we need to cut the amount of water used for irrigation, because they, want, they are thinking that they are going for a water scarcity in a few years. The irrigation department, which was working separately, their strategic plan was, we need to increase our food production, so we will be implementing, or we will be doubling the amount of irrigated water we are using to uh, growing our crop. Look at how, we, like we've got like the balance, while the department of water inside the same government is talking about cutting the amount of irrigated water, the other department in the same government is talking about doubling the amount of water to be used. And I think, not only the national level we need to look at, even we may need to start to look at even a lower level, how we can start the cooperation and the work collectively with each other. I'm just giving here some facts about informing or ensuring that the problem is not a source. 
how much we are like in UK, for example, we have we have got about 8.3 million tons of food and drink each each year being discarded, and the same or most most likely the same is happening across the US, and we 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 find how much water we are wasting in terms of unaccounted water and how much efforts we need to put in order to secure water just not only for the sake of the water resources improvement, but sometimes as this graph, it's not only we are providing water for drinking purposes or for water uses for purposes, but we need to ensure, and this is one of the uh, Gulf countries uh, fraction about how much they are investing in, in red in desalination because they've got a water scarcity, but they are not actually, they are a bit relaxed in terms of the food availability. So if we want to view this, someone will argue that, okay, we tried to solve our water problem away from our food, and we didn't need that much uh, like integration of the Nexus. But the, to be honest, if a deeper look at this thing will identify that what we are looking here, what we are looking at here is completely what we are talking about Nexus. The virtual water trade, which is going to the Gulf is one of the most uh, major virtual water, water trade in the globe. So even if we are not growing our farms or our products at our own land, but the import of these water, of these products, which can generate, which definitely generate some import of the virtual water is there. So the, rather than investing that much of water in terms of the desalination or different resources, I think the idea about how to work closely and collectively between all the countries in terms of how to make good, sustainable, actually, interaction with other countries about how to secure different things. And to be honest, if we want to talk about the security again, I think we don't need to ignore the fact that we've got about one third of our productive food is wasted. And the question is for everyone here, guys, is how much do you think in your country of how is your country is doing in terms of food waste? And I think everyone knows Maybe about the country is not going to be a big feeling, but to be honest, when I did uh, when when I was asked the same question at my own level, I was even in a shock because I can look at my kitchen, I can see what's happening in the local level, and as a scientist who has some interest in this area, I would say that it takes me to really think about the daily attitude that we are doing, and this is actually taking us to the next part, which. If we want actually to get a pathway to solve the problem, are we, are we inviting international community to work together in order to solve it? Or are we calling national? Or are we talking about individuals in the, their households? There is huge discussion about the national, uh, international and national interest. I think the examples that I've just given about Australia and China or US and China or the Gulf area it does actually show that it's more likely that we, we might be facing a really conflict of interest among the nations or even with that, with inside the local nation. By the example, we talked about the different departments within the, the local government. And this is exactly can lead us, which might not be the uh, optimal case, but at least we need to start from a point which I would suggest that we can start from a bottom up approach. Bottom up, which means that we need to start from a um, local household we need to look at what we are doing how we are doing and where we can improve and i think this is exactly what the hasin the hussein uh, integrated global media, uh, model was addressing and this is um i'm just trying to get some of the brief of the paper that they they um modeled the household and how much the household management could contribute to the food the food security and I believe this is a really interesting paper and it has actually highlighted most of the things that we as in the local level, in individual level, are trying to find them. Rather than talking about food security as something that we don't identify ourselves where we are sitting at, I think that the local end user model from the bottom up approach will definitely alarm us what we are doing, how we are doing. And I think there are you can add to the list of the, the top list, which we are talking about the consumption, the attitude, the habits, the duration of cooking, the amount of water you are using, how much you consume, gardening. You can add to the list, a list can go, uh, go on until you can find actually every single step. And I think 
this exactly will alarm us and will tell us where to start from rather than just keep talking about different things. And I think the results or the outcome from the model for what we are doing right now, where our shifting interest should be in a few years. Um, and I, I guess if someone wanted to model this rather than saying about 2050, it might be like 2030, the need actually to grow vegetables and foods to be like self uh, dependent and to look at the food waste. Because from that model, I think the outcome was showing that the amount or the daily behavior, and it doesn't make big difference from a poor family to a rich family, but it's a percentage of the national income of the local income for each family. And this might give us actually some of the hints about what we can do in the near future on the local level, which I think we can form something as a grassroots by making really we need as a scientist, as interest. And I thank the, the people who are actually working in this forum because I think this is a really impactful grassroots. Look how many people we are getting from different countries, from all the continents. And I think everyone now is have the responsibility to be an ambassador to promote this and to start to look at the issue with, uh, with their neighbors and their close circles about how to address these issues and to start having an action rather than waiting for their government or for the international United Nations, whatever. We have to take the initiative and we have to start. And I, at the end of the day, I'm really uh, grateful to be here. Thank everyone for that. And thank you very much for your attention.